three witches live in Twin Peaks. While Margaret's log whispering and Sarah's visions are accepted as truly supernatural powers by their fellow townsfolk as well as by we the viewers, Nadine's super strength is generally dismissed as a merely physiological effect of the excess adrenaline that Doc Hayward mentions. But some of her feats are outlandishly impossible, and Mr. C channels a similar superpower in The Return when he crashes the boys' club and wins their wrestling competition. What is this? High school? And if Nadine's powers are supernatural, that points directly to a context which can also make sense of her delusions of youth. Because three witches is a whole thing. A classic callback to Norse mythology made famous by Shakespeare and Wagner and The Wizard of Oz, which just happens to be David Lynch's number one most referenced film, as explored in a recent documentary. So if there were three witches in Twin Peaks, that would be very on brand. In the old myths, they were the Norns who live at the base of the world tree, spinning and measuring and cutting the threads of human lives. One was a wizened old crone, one a mature adult, and the third a young maiden. Well, Margaret may not be especially old in the original series, but she is a confirmed widower, and in the return, she really is on the doorstep of death. The years haven't been kind to Sarah, but she is not a frail old lady in the return. She's even an object of sexual attention in the bar, before reminding us that she's a weird sister. Meanwhile, we see Nadine rejuvenated by Dr. Amp, walking a great distance without breaking a sweat to give Ed her blessing to be with Norma, just like she did when she thought they were all in high school. The age attributions of the Norns are present in the original series, and reinforced in The Return. The three Norns are sometimes associated with different directions, as in The Wizard of Oz, where the witches are known by which point of the compass they rule over, rather than by names. At Laura's funeral, we see Sarah and Nadine directly opposite one another, and Margaret is as close to the head of the casket as she can be without displacing the priest. Her log even sticks in front of him a bit. So, the three witches of Twin Peaks are pretty much standing at the points of the compass here. Not around a world tree, but Laura's casket is made of wood, and when we go inside her grave with Leland, we see a prominent root. Amidst all the talk of logs and trees and ghost wood, spark wood, stern wood, Laura's body is found next to a huge dead tree. The world tree? Killed by the evil that men do? The world tree has a name, Yggdrasil, which translates as Odin's horse. Odin sought wisdom and power by hanging from the tree, and also gave up one of his eyes in order to drink from one of the magic wells at its base. These wells and the tree's roots lead to other realms, such as Jotunheim, the world of giants and dwarfs and other curious creatures that are neither humans nor gods. From Twin Peaks, one can travel to this red realm via a little pool of water next to the trees of Glastonbury Grove, or at the foot of a huge tree stump known as Jack Rabbit's Palace. Hmm. In the Icelandic poet Snorri Sturluson's later retelling, one of these magic wells isn't in the ground at all, but the sky! Ha! Imagine that! A well portal in the sky. Episode 6 of the first season, Cooper's Dreams, firmly establishes Norse mythology as a relevant subtext. The Icelandics are partying at the Great Northern, and Odin's name is triple underlined by See you later, Audrey. See you later. Then... I'll see you later, sons of Odin! Just before Ben Horn leans in to remind us that Odin is missing an eye. Meanwhile, the Bookhouse Boys are shadowed not by an owl, but a bird associated with Odin, the Raven, whose voice triple underlines the sudden appearance of Margaret. About time you got here. This is her biggest scene, where she uses her witchy talent to channel the testimony of her log. 
And the episode closes with the big party, where the Major opines... Of course, the modern age has changed forever the way your people live, Mr. Thorson. But it would be my guess that there still remains a tremendous vestigial interest in the legends and folklore of ancient Iceland. Vestigial. Absolutely. <laughs> That's quite a concentration of relevant details in Cooper's dreams. They might have been trying to tell us something. This is Norns Creek that flows down from the Canadian Rockies into the town of Castlegar. Looks lovely, doesn't it? Cold as hell, no doubt, but clean and clear. Well, Norns Creek is just across the border from where Twin Peaks, Washington is supposed to be. In fact, the tiny town of Castlegar is mentioned in Season 2, when Jean Renault gives Ben Horn directions to where he should drop off the ransom money. Five miles east of Grand Fork on the road to Castlegar. What are the odds? Castlegar's 15 minutes of network fame is why there's a Twin Peaks trail nearby, but just a little further north, not far from Mount Odin in the gold range of the Monashi Mountains, is a small lake whose name predates the show, nestled tightly between two peaks named Integrity and Initiative. 